Does anyone remember this episode of history? Listen. The title is a play on this old 70s television series called The Six Million Dollar Man. Dev, that's either short for developer or development. Either way, this presentation is primarily about a single FileMaker developer supposedly implementing $2.6 million worth of features in a single development project in less than one year. Before we get into all that, you might first want to know who I am. I am the $2.6 million developer. So this presentation is based mostly on this one person's experience. I volunteer as a co-chair of the DigFM user group that meets at FileMaker Inc. headquarters in Santa Clara. Volunteer work doesn't explain why I call myself the $2.6 million developer. So I get paid to be a senior systems analyst at San Jose State University, where I get to be a full-time in-house FileMaker developer. But my salary doesn't explain that $2.6 million either, unfortunately. Actually, I wasn't even hired to be a FileMaker developer. Before that, I used to be the departmental desktop network and network server guy. Then one day, I was assigned to replace an interdepartmental paper process with something, anything, over the network. So I downloaded a, 30, a free 30-day trial of FileMaker Pro version 4 because it looked like it would do the job. Not just on Windows, but also on Macs, which is the computer platform the other department was using. That was fine with me because Windows has an overabundance of applications anyway, but I was of the opinion that when there's a choice, it was the cross-platform applications that were better established and more robust. I quickly looked over the tutorial that came with the 30-day trial and then gave those departments a working peer networked solution in less than two weeks. Since then, I've developed and maintained over 30 FileMaker solutions at San Jose State University. I've also trained the same number of people to be able to do the same. The solutions circled in yellow highlighters are what I would call electronic content management or ECM solutions, which I will also mention in this presentation. At the bottom, Enrollment Backfile and Eval UG were initially developed by people I trained. I'll be mentioning more about Eval UG later. The one that moved to the top right, called NCAA, that was my very first FileMaker solution. The Registrar manual, manual at the bottom uh, that was developed by an office worker with no programming experience who I trained only minimally. Again, in student involvement uh, and transcript request down there at the bottom are two more that were developed by two of my trainees. And in addition to all these, there are two other servers on campus with solutions developed and hosted by people I trained. Apart from FileMaker, I have implemented ANSI X12 electronic data interchange at multiple campuses consulted for the California Community College's system, EDI implementation project, and was involved in various levels 
at various levels in implementing or integrating four different electronic content management or ECM systems from outside vendors. Needless to say, I no longer provide desktop network or general server support. Now, before you get the idea that I'm all work and no play, I do have hobbies. First, I'm known as the guy who has six children, but that's not all I do for exercise. I juggle, I teach people how to juggle, and I'm the staff advisor for the juggling club at SJSU. Uh, the hooded one is me juggling with my three sons. Also, you remember that Pokemon Go game uh, lots of people used to play where they go all over the place to capture and release or raise virtual creatures? Well, I do that in real life with real creatures. Hours after the DevCon 2017 sessions were over and the sun set over Phoenix, my youngest son and I headed out into the desert landscape to find these two attendees. This is what scorpions look like when they fluoresce under UV light. They're always dressed for a rave party. And there's more. The bright blue tarantula on the left is about to go extinct in the wild from habitat loss in India, and all the P. metallicas in the U.S. like mine are captive bred. The roach I'm holding at the top uh, still hasn't been identified as a species yet. Also, while we were at DevCon, we loaned out one of my wife's tarantulas to a high school student in Phoenix so that he could mate it to his female, as you can see down in the, down in the middle there. At the lower right, you can see my youngest son's time-lapse of his mealworm colony. And that other voice you might hear narrating the roach activity, that's my grandson. He's much cuter and smarter than the other bugs, so we taught him how to talk and let him roam around the house. Okay, the squeamish can open their eyes now because we're back on topic. First thing... I want you to see is an inspirational three and a half minute video released by an ECM vendor uh, about some major technological achievements they accomplished with content management at a university a few years ago. I actually, I actually you know, started here as a student assistant and filed papers away in folders and unfortunately um, students are still doing that, filing papers into folders. Oracle ECM, we're actually deploying this across the entire campus. We have today uh, multiple imaging systems uh, run across campus, and this is going to allow us to integrate that into a central system, saving money and improving security as well. We process about 42,000 applications. That's graduate, undergraduate, and credential students. We receive thousands of transcripts, and they come in all different sizes and formats. The sooner students have a decision from their university, certainly from San Jose State, they can make choices. We've been finding that it's taken us four to six weeks before we can respond back to a student. So early admissions means that students have their decisions on time and ready and be prepared to come here in the fall semester. I look at the length of time it actually um, was taking to do things in a, in a manual situation where we were looking at folders and individual papers and this is really going to give us the ability to make those decisions quicker, um, move someone through the queue uh, much quicker. Um, I'm really excited to be able to deliver better service to them and this is, this is going to take us to that level. We're going to be using eyelid component of this to allow us to integrate directly from the PeopleSoft screen to the, the source documents that generated the information on that screen. Hitting a button will actually call up the actual student transcript of the documents that go along with the application. For years we've wanted the button, so it's finally here. <laughs> it's finally here. Our process up until now has been I want to touch the paper. 
having no paper and having the document actually imaged is going to be a big change for our evaluations unit. The evaluators are doing a manual calculation right on the paper transcript and then entering, rekeying the data. Imagers has created a workflow form that has a built-in calculator. All they have to do is just select from the screen. It's just like magic. That's an end-to-end -end process improvement. Um, I don't know of any campus within the CSU that um, has all of that. Ultimately, this just gets down to how we use our resources. What's coming with this system is going to help us so much to be able to use the manpower that we have in a, a really efficient way. I think we're really going to be able to show people that we're moving into that, that zone of being able to deliver that kind of service that we, we've hoped to do for, for many years. This was the third ECM system I've seen implemented for that department. And after watching the first two go down in flames, I was awe-inspired by this video. As a result of implementing all that technology, that campus won not just one, but two major awards. These major awards came at a steep price. That university paid the contracted implementers $2.55 million over the course of seven years plus expended thousands of university staff and manager hours over the same period of time. These major awards must be Italian because we discovered something about them. How do you pronounce that? I'll have to ask Vince. Not only was the basis of these major awards fragile, but the entire video release was fake news. That's right. That video made it seem like they had implemented four major features, features that were the primary reason the university spent $2.55 million and thousands of university staff and manager hours over the course of seven years. Two of those features were never implemented into production, and the other two features were implemented so poorly that it drastically increased the number of staff hours required to maintain it instead of reducing staff hours. What a mess. These are the four things I want to share about this experience. How did they get into that mess in the first place? Also second and third place. How did I learn what really happened? How did a FileMaker developer fulfill all four failed features? And how do we make more $2.6 million developers like this? Along the way, I will share some proverbial wisdom related to all this. This is not an exhaustive how-to presentation, just a presentation of some extra tips I've learned along the way. First, I want to say nobody in that promo video was responsible for getting them into that mess in the first place. It all began with executives who were long gone before they got involved. As I mentioned earlier, this was their third ECM system. Most of the worst systems implementations I've seen began with happy executives. That's right. A happy executive would come back from some sort of conference and say, hey, look what we're getting. Let's get this implemented right away. A few months before our first ECM system, my director sent me to an electronic content management conference to find out about technology and prospective vendors, I came back with a report of a few vendors I thought had good, sustainable systems for our campus. Nothing happened until a few months later when she came back from her manager conferences, one of her manager conferences, saying, Hey, Eric, we're getting a new electronic content management system, and I want you to work with the vendor to implement it. 
it wasn't any of the ones in my report, but hey, some campus in Southern California was having wonderful success with it, so it had to be good, right? There were a few things about that Southern California campus I found out later. Because that campus down south had suffered extensive earthquake damage, they received much more funding to implement the system than we did. I think we only invested sixty or seventy thousand dollars in their software. Two, the contracted vendor's base of operation was right down their street, not ours. Three, their campus ECM operations were heavily subsidized on an ongoing basis by the chancellor's office. Needless to say, since the system was very closed, we were limited by the money we could pay to the vendor. And our implementation was very disappointing compared to that happy campus in Southern California. As of this year, we are actually on our fourth ECM system. That means they have ditched three ECM systems by now. Which brings me to the next mess maker: grumpy executives. Yes. Executives who would get so angry with the ECM vendors that they would stop paying maintenance before they got another ECM system to replace the one they wanted to burn. In fact, it took them so long to find and implement the third system that the vendor for the second system had already fixed most of the problems worth complaining about before we migrated.、And、that system, that second system, was a steal. It was only a hundred thousand dollars for a complete campus site license, and it was a very open system, easy to interface with. Oops, too late. And then there's the indifferent executive. Often these are managers who are already getting ready to retire, find another job, or have already found a way to pass the hot ECM potato to someone else. Let me tell you. The time to be indifferent about a system is not during the implementation approval phase, just before the vendor gets paid. So, what do all these messmakers have in common?、Uh, they make decisions based on emotions. And what's missing from all these messmakers? Might it be a logical decision-making process? I'm not an expert on decision-making, but I have a few ideas. When you want to find out how good a product or service is, one, don't ask salespeople. Of course, they're gonna say everything is awesome. Now it makes sense to get references and ask customers how good it is, but don't rely on manager references only. Why? Managers are at least part-time politicians who are more obliged to say things like "everything is cool." Their jobs depend on how successful they can present themselves and their implementations. That's how we ended up with our first ECM system. And other mediocre things, a manager asking other managers how well they are doing their jobs. How do you avoid everything is awesome, everything is cool? It's not easy, but somehow you have to find the customers who actually use or implement those systems and services directly. They are more likely to tell the truth, or at least make such poor politicians. That they are more likely to drop hints of the issues they are experiencing. I find union employees the best at letting it all out, since they are pretty, pretty well protected.、Um, but even with vendors, once I get past their salespeople and their project managers, and talk to their programmers and other hands-on people, I get a better picture of what the system or service is really like. And more recently, I've learned to watch out for one more messmaker. Beware of in-house cheerleaders. I don't have anything against cheerleaders, except when they are cheering for the wrong team. 
We've had in-house project managers do this to us. I remember one who was in meetings with us and the ECM vendor, all at the same time, same room, gushing about how wonderful their system is and how great a job their team was doing for us. Our operational people hadn't even approved of the implementation yet, and they hadn't yet paid the vendor. This was like trying to help someone negotiate at a car dealership when they blurt out loud, Oh my gosh, this car is so perfect for me. I just have to have this car today. If I don't get this car, I'm going to die. What else can we do? What does RTFM stand for? Read the future manual. If you end up buying a system, isn't documentation part of what you'll be stuck with? When they were in the process of buying their third ECM system, I had already implemented and maintained their two previous ECM systems. So someone said, hey, Eric has a lot of experience with these kind of systems. Let's put him on the selection committee. After a few meetings, going over all the vendor responses, I realized, you know, all we're doing here is looking at their carefully choreographed dog and pony shows and reading all their promises that their systems will fulfill all our requirements. Meanwhile, we have two previous ECM systems we know failed to fulfill their promises. By the time we finally look through the manuals of those two previous systems to figure out how their systems were going to meet our requirements, we discovered three things. One, their documentation was inadequate. Sometimes it would merely describe a feature without fully describing how to implement it. And we ended up having to call technical support for several of the features only mentioned in the manual. Two, the human interfaces were clumsy. As bad as the documentation was, it still could have warned us that we would have been dealing with poorly designed human interfaces. When on-site support for our second ECM system was helping us configure it, uh, he, uh, he refused to use any of the built-in GUI interfaces, either for account management or document management, anything. When we asked him why he typed SQL for everything, he said, it's just easier this way. Three, the features were non-existent. They either required complex programming or were completely unsustainable. So knowing all this, I told the committee, hey, we need to get copies of all their documentation, either in print or at least in electronic formats. The head of the committee uh, was from the purchasing department. He said, they won't want to share their documentation with us until after we purchase it. So I went back to my office, went to the vendor websites, downloaded documentation for all the vendors who published it on their websites, and then used website contact information to ask all of them for their documentation, as if I were some random person interested in their product. They all shipped me printed copies of all their documentation within a week. Now, me being the happy, helpful employee, I, I wrote to the committee, giving them the good news. Guess what? The head of the committee blasted me in front of his managers, my supervisor, and in front of one of my colleagues. He told me that I violated the confidentiality agreement I signed. And that was... And that I was off the committee. That I must destroy all manuals and RFP proposals, and that I might be looking forward to disciplinary action. I, being a union employee, reread the confidentiality agreement I signed and said, no, I did not violate any confidentiality anything, and I will not be destroying anything, because we'll be taking all this documentation to court if you don't drop it. They dropped it. But thankfully, I was off that committee. So, 
Without my help, or the help of any useful documentation, they apparently picked one of the systems out of a hat for a mere $1.3 million. A whole year and five months go by, and they still haven't succeeded in implementing their $1.3 million baby. <laughs> that buyer from purchasing who gave me such a hard time, he was long gone from the campus already. And I had a new supervisor. Then people said, Hey, Eric has a lot of experience with these kind of systems. Let's put him on the implementation committee. After a few meetings with the vendor, I realized, you know, we can't just keep meeting with this vendor and letting them tell us what they are going to do. We need to know how the system works so we can configure it and maintain it ourselves. Meanwhile, we have two previous ECM systems. The first ECM system was completely closed and we were completely helpless with trying to integrate that system with anything. The second ECM system was quite open. We could see both the tables and the document stores and quickly learn that structurally it was very well organized and not overly complicated. So knowing all this, I told the committee, hey, we need at least read access to all the tables so we can see how the system works for ourselves and be prepared to report from it integrate it and extract data as needed. The vendor spent half an hour asking what tables? While I asked how do you run the system on Oracle and SQL Server without tables? You don't need tables, they said. It's all cabinets and packages. After nearly an hour of their evasive talk, I got frustrated. But my supervisor took the vendor's side, saying the department programmers don't need that kind of knowledge and access anymore because the computer center DBAs will, would handle all that ECM stuff from now on. Uh, and then I got kicked off that committee. So fast forward four years. Somewhere in that time span, they finally forced the system into production, ignoring all the negative test results, and were shocked that the system that was supposed to save them time and money was forcing them to hire temps and more positions to take care of it and to organize the documents and data in it. When they got tired of being nickeled and dimed for every fix and enhancement, they told the staff and an imaging supervisor to stop complaining because a nickel was at least $50,000. That's when the complaints we overheard from staff and imaging supervisors on the floor became unbearable, and our manager, without admitting he was wrong, quietly let us pursue both read and write access to all the ECM tables, I was, those ones I was requesting four years earlier. So, scrutinize the schema before you buy. But before I move on, there is one more required aspect I would never want to ignore with any new system. Data access. Every new system and service we come across these days proudly proclaims and insists on importing all kinds of data from all the other systems we have, but none of them rush to mention how we can get data out of their system or service. In fact, I've run across several that make it very difficult and nearly impossible to get all that data out of their system so we can use it in another system. Why is that? Is it because they think their system should be the end all for all our processing needs? Are they trying to prevent us from suddenly exporting all their data to migrate to another system or service? I don't know. but. We usually need or want to use that data in ways they didn't plan. From now on, I don't care what data your system needs or wants to import until you tell me how I can get all the data out of your system by myself. By the way, are any of these issues with the FileMaker platform in general? No. And how about with our custom solutions. So anyway, I got kicked off committees for this third ECM system twice. So how did I learn what really happened? 
Well, one, I was in the vicinity. I work as an in-house developer in the same building and on the same floor as all the people who had to use this third ECM system. In fact, I just, I'm just a couple cubicles away from the imaging operations area. By the way, the vicinity also works great for agile development. Two, inquiry. Just ask the users how things are going. Remember, the users. Three, transparency. I see a lot of state and local governments have transparency laws and policies now, so they have to post it on websites when they spend significant amounts of money. Uh, that's the, right up there, that's the website I went to. And that right there, that's what it looks like. Hmm. Maybe these sites could be useful to consultancies who think they could save their government some money with superior and less costly custom apps. <laughs> the website isn't very friendly, though. Uh, but look, what do those buttons at the top say? Is that Excel? CSV? Do they say I can download data into a little FileMaker solution and a sub-summary report? That's what I did. And that's what it looks like. Hey, look at that. Uh, $161 million for one contractor in less than a year. Anyway. All this talk about expensive, failing systems is getting me a little stressed. Time to stop and relax with a little FileMaker development. Uh, sorry that I've spoken so long so far without showing you anything FileMaker related, quite FileMaker related yet. You know, uh, sub-summary reports are pretty basic, but in the 20 years I've been doing FileMaker development, I don't know if I've had to make sub-summary reports more than a dozen times. So I'm not very good at it. Maybe you can help me with a problem I had. Okay, here's my okay, sub-summary sub report. Over here on the left, it's uh, sorted by name, contractor name at the moment. I have this little button that I can click, and it toggles between sorting by the amount, descending order, or sorting by the name. When I sort by the amount, descending order, you can see over here on the left, it's 113 million. And over on the right, where it's sorted by the name, it's 119 million. Now, that's not right. So, why? Can anybody tell me well, what's going on here and why this isn't working? What am I doing wrong? Well, let's take a look at the layout. I'm looking at the sub summary here. Um, the let's see the sub summary when sorted by the contractor's name. Uh, that's good, at least for when the contractor name is going here. Cancel, cancel. All right, and let me show you the script. Uh, the script runs, says, well, if the sort by amount is not equal to true, well, it's not true yet because you just clicked on it, and now it's going to be sorting by the amount. And so when it sorts by the amount, uh, this is what it's doing. It's sorting by the amount, descending order and then by the contractor's name in ascending order. I figured, well, because it has to at least sort by the contractor's name uh, in order to get, uh, in order to work in the sub-summary report. And then, of course, this is the easy one right here. It's when it's just sorting by contractor, you just sort by the contractor's name. So, I'll just show you what I was doing wrong. Uh, actually, I know the answer. It, it took me a little while to figure it out. But when I want to sort, whoops, wrong one. When I want to sort by the by descending order on the total amount, I have to go down here and click this reorder based on a summary field. And if I click specify. That's where I can I can specify 
sorting by the um, total amount. Um, not perfectly intuitive, but yes, you, you are sorting by the contractor's name, but you're reordering based on a summary field, and that's what gets it to sort by the amount descending. So this one actually works. Let me show you that. Cancel. So if I go to the correct one over here, um, contract, contract report, and this one sorts descending order. Ah, Sunt is at the top, and if I wanted to compare that to uh, this one, where's Sunt on here? $161 million. Well, Sunt, probably could just kind of search for it. Um, there it is, 161. So either way it's sorted, this one actually works. Anyway, this is what I learned from that subsummary report and the other things I did. From uh, let's see, May 7th, 2008 to September 1st, 2015, they paid that ECM vendor $2,546,648.67 in 12 contract payments. Any payments under $50,000 were not reported. And during that time, they had at least one in-house full-time project manager for at least a year. And also during that time, the ECM system and vendor required the attention of multiple in-house managers, project managers, programmers, and operational staff, implementing, testing, and maintaining part-time for over seven years. So what do you think? Would all that bring up the cost to at least $2.6 million? And finally, I learned just by talking to users that major features never worked or were working very badly. Now, if all those reasons you give to justify spending $2.6 million on a system remain unfulfilled, then you could call that a $2.6 million deficit, I think, from that promotional video I showed earlier. Here are the four main features justifying the new ECM system. Uh, number one, document workflow and high efficiency. The staff were supposed to get automatically notified when it was their turn to look at documents. Two, integration to PeopleSoft, the button. The button was a elusive feature that was supposed to put buttons on an applicant's records in PeopleSoft so that staff could click it and suddenly see all the documents in People's well, not PeopleSoft, but in the ECM system. They had been dreaming of this feature since the 90s when they got their first ECM system. Three, integration to PeopleSoft, updating PeopleSoft data. As soon as the documents came in the ECM system was supposed to, well, as soon as the documents come in, the ECM system is supposed to update PeopleSoft checklist tables and let everyone know and that those checklist it, items were complete. And number four, built-in evaluations calculator that works like magic. This was supposed to take all the courses and grades transferring from a college and determine if an applicant qualifies for admission. Admission. Uh, the problem was none of these features were delivered at all or to any operational staff or manager satisfaction. So, one, the document workflow was so inefficient that n not even a temp hires in 16 hour days could make up for the time it took to maintain it. Uh, the button integration of PeopleSoft was never delivered. The Let's see, oh yeah, updating PeopleSoft data seemed to work pretty well from one perspective, except behind the scenes, it required people running on treadmill 16 hours a day. And the last one, the built-in evaluations calculator absolutely did not work and was never utilized. And that according to the people I spoke to, uh, the users. 
Now, the person who was working those 16-hour days, not everybody was doing that, just, just one guy actually, uh, to keep the system running was the supervisor of the imaging operations area. He was a surprisingly patient guy, but he was getting tired, not just of doing all that work, but also of begging the vendor and others to fix the workflow feature. Since I was the guy who helped them develop by developing solutions to track paper and to track transfer uh, oh, and to transfer incoming electronic documents and to generate PDFs out of electronic data. He asked whether I somehow could use any of that skill and technology to replace feature number three, updating PeopleSoft data. I said, maybe. The issue wasn't whether I had enough skill or whether FileMaker had the right technology. The issue was always getting access to systems external to FileMaker solutions. Ironically, years before they even thought of buying this ECM system, I had asked for this access to help admissions update their data in bulk, but they said no. No one is allowed to update PeopleSoft tables directly. They had alternatives which involved staging tables, but the PeopleSoft programming department didn't offer the time to set that up for me. Funny how a $1.3 million purchase suddenly makes the very same request for the very same purpose seem much more important than the request from an in-house programmer on salary. Well, we asked the right people in the right way for right access to the Oracle table they created as a staging table for PeopleSoft, and we got lucky. Now we had the two things I needed. Read access to all the ECM tables where the documents were received and indexed, and write access to the staging table that updates PeopleSoft. Ideally, an Oracle programmer would have fixed this by directly having the ECM system update the staging table. But no one with those skills and levels of access was doing that anytime soon, so I inserted a FileMaker solution. Now, with that, I have two choices. I could have simply added the table I was going to use from, from these two systems as external SQL sources, or for the read-only ECM, I could import that data into FileMaker from an ODBC source, uh, import the records we need for the updates. For the ECM data, I chose the latter, except I not only imported the records we needed to update PeopleSoft every day, I imported all the records from the ECM system and wrote the query and wrote, yeah, wrote the query to check for any changes in the ECM so that the FileMaker ECM solution would completely mirror the, the Oracle ECM data. Overkill, right? I think that first import took several days because the Oracle server kept disconnecting. When it came to the staging table, however, I simply added the staging table as an ESS shadow table in the FileMaker solution so that it would be easier for both read and write, you know, it would be easier to both read and write to the tables with set field script steps. And this is what it looks like in FileMaker's Pro relationship graph. On the left is my table where I import all the ECM data that I could get my hands on, and on the right, the italics indicates a table from an external source, in this case, an external SQL source. Uh, the uniquely keyed relationship allows me to add records and data to the external staging table on the right, based on ECM data stored on the left. On a utility layout we use to script this update, it looks like this. You can see the keys in bold like EMPL ID and application number. All the data inside that tab control over here on the right is staging table data showing from the ESS shadow table. All the data outside that tab control is data stored in FileMaker tables. Most of it imported and mirrored from the ECM system. 
A script just loops through all the imported ECM data that needs to update the staging table and sets fields in the external staging table. On top of my daily work, this took a few weeks to implement and test, especially since I was still learning about what all the tables and fields were used for during that time. And I had to overcome some inconsistencies in the external system. Fortunately, I had the advantage of having made a pre-existing FileMaker solution I could just build on top of. It was called DocuTrack. Mission 3 accomplished. Mission 1, 2, and 4 remaining. Hey, now it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Everywhere I go. Let me know if you have any questions. Well... Updating the PeopleSoft checklist table was the most critical reason imaging operations had to keep maintaining that workflow process. So once that critical reason was gone, the imaging operations supervisor couldn't wait to get back to his life again, and he stopped maintaining it. Can you see the problem that might have caused? Yes, the workflow feature might not have been the most critical reason to maintain the workflow process, because staff had other ways to find out what needed to be done, but those ways greatly lengthened the amount of time the admissions coordinators needed to spend, f to spend finding the right work to do, and they were already understaffed and overworked at the time. The lead in that area found out the role I played in helping the imaging operations supervisor feel comfortable with turning off the workflow, and she came crying to me. I could have said, hey, don't look at me. I'm not the one who decided to turn it off. Go talk to the managers. But instead I said, okay, let me see what I can do about it. How was I going to fix this issue for them? They were desperate. They needed this fixed the very same day it was turned off, and it was already, it already been a few days since it was turned off. The ECM tables that controlled workflow were a lot more complicated and obscure than the tables that merely indexed and organized the documents. I wasn't going to figure out how their ECM workflow tables functioned in a day or even in a week while still doing my usual work. Workflow promised to do all kinds of things for them, but there was really only one thing they needed. When certain documents first arrived, they needed to be notified to look at them. That's easy. Just make a field you can flag whenever those documents come in. Except in their ECM Oracle tables, they don't have access to make fields or tables or to program them. Of course, I could make my own tables and my own table and my field in FileMaker, but joining tables from a FileMaker table to an Oracle ESS table and showing both in a list can be slow. On the previous mission, I joined a FileMaker table to an Oracle shadow table because I was doing all my finds in the FileMaker table and only changing hundreds of records in the joined shadow table as part of a daily batch process. It was kind of slow but fast enough for background work. This time, users would be constantly searching and displaying data from both related tables, and the performance relating to a shadow table would be unacceptable. Fortunately, I had a secret weapon ready to go. Remember all the days I wasted importing and synchronizing all the documents, all the documents data to FileMaker? Uh, it's a good thing I did that earlier because users were now going to want to see the status of all the documents for every applicant, not just the new documents I needed to update. Since I already had all the ECM document data in a FileMaker solution called DocuTrack, I could now quickly and efficiently join it to the document queue flag I created in FileMaker. And I would also be able to join it to PeopleSoft's admission applicant data which I also have in a FileMaker solution we call Next Steps. On the relationship graph, that looks like this. Um, Met Mentor Apps is our old name for the main admissions applicant table. 
And way down there is the applicant's key field we use to join to all their documents. Uh, that would be the app document table occurrence right there. And a little up and to the left, we have that document queue table, app.q, for flagging new documents of interest. On a layout, it looks like this. I know this says the documents layout, but in next steps, this is an application record that has a portal listing all the documents for that applicant. Notice the queue check the queue checkbox on the left. These documents are queued as soon as they arrive in the table and the staff unqueue them as they go through each one. Sometime before all this I made their staff a custom dialog that allows them to find various cohorts. All they have to do is check which co cohort they want or multiple co cohorts to narrow down their search. Thus all I had to do is add queued documents to this list of searchable cohorts. Now, not only could they find whichever queued documents they need to work on, but they could see it in context with the admission applications on a system they were already using, and even constrained by any combination of prioritized custom finds. I delivered what you are looking at right here within 24 hours, and I did not have to work overtime on it. Of course, all this was built on top of an existing FileMaker solution. This workflow function actually works better than the one that cost $2.6 million, except for one thing. In the expensive ECM system workflow, users can click on listed documents and it will open the document in the ECM system. I had done things like that before in a previous document management system. All the documents were on a Windows Server file share and all I had to do is point a FileMaker calculated container field at a path uh, their system stored in a field. In some web-based ECM systems it's often pretty simple to calculate a URL from key fields stored in their system. Uh, then I would simply use a web viewer on a FileMaker layout or just make buttons that execute an open URL script. This fancy ECM system, however, was more complicated than that. Before opening the URL, you would have to set headers and post something before getting an ECM server generated URL you could use to finally open the document. Uh, when I was working on this, version 16 hadn't come out yet, so FileMaker's insert from URL didn't have curl options yet. That's okay because Base Elements has a plugin that allowed me to do what I just what I needed. I installed the plugin, uh, the Base Elements plugin, on the server and performed those prerequisite steps on server so I wouldn't have to install the plugin on all the clients. Now, my FileMaker solution could open all those documents at the press of a button. In fact, you can see those buttons in gold at the right of each document in the list. All this took me a couple more days because I really didn't know anything about setting headers for post methods at first, and I still barely have a grasp on it. Now remember the button every, everyone wanted in PeopleSoft so bad and for so long? Here's the irony. Although PeopleSoft is the system of record and all users have to use it to update applicant data, PeopleSoft is not the system everyone starts from. The FileMaker solution called Next Steps is where 50 to 60 concurrent users start and end their workday. It's where most of the staff get their lists and look at PeopleSoft data all day long, avoiding the PeopleSoft interface as much as possible, actually. So, there was never any point in adding button, buttons for documents on PeopleSoft pages. This is where they should have wanted the buttons in the first place. 
So, not only did I accomplish mission one and two, but the results of number one had a few advantages over what was originally delivered, and number two was far better than what they had been asking for all these years. That leaves only mission four. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about missions one and two. Before I get to mission four, there was one thing that bothered me about mission one. Even though I at least matched their required workflow feature as it was delivered, the $2.6 million system promised more custom programmable workflows for all kinds of purposes. It's just no one seemed to have the time or expertise to program it. Meanwhile, staff workflow was still operating on manually, oper uh, manually updated Excel and Google worksheets all over the office to tell which staff which applications needed which work and, the wh and which ones were completed. Uh, made me nauseous just looking at the list of dozens of different spreadsheets they were using. Something had to be done and quickly. Okay, I had a queue table with a one-to-one -one relationship to documents, but it didn't make any sense to use that because all the other workflow tasks had nothing to do with specific documents. They had to do with specific applications. Also, I didn't want to have to add to the table and layout fields to flag for every single task they could think of every time they thought of a new task and then program for it. That's why I came up with a many-to-one table that could relate several tasks to a single application. And on a list layout, it looks like this. This layout is a list of applications, and that tasks button popover is a list of pending and completed tasks for that application. And this is the setup table for all the possible task actions. And I don't set I don't set up these task actions for the staff. The staff set these up all by themselves. And remember that custom search dialog? I just added a pop-up menu. Uh, let's see. Where did I put that? Yeah, down at the bottom there. So they can retrieve any task action they need to work on. And that and even in combination with other uh, other cohorts there. Uh, of course, this isn't a very this isn't a very sophisticated workflow solution, but one, it works. Two, it's very easy to set up and use. Three, it doesn't require a programmer who went to a week of product training. The users can set this up themselves. That's four. Five, this workflow solution is very sustainable. Six, it completely eliminated the need for over a dozen task-related spreadsheets. And seven, if we want more sophisticated workflow features, it's very easy to build on the solution with a few fields and scripts. On these counts, it was far superior to the $2.6 million ECM workflow solution, especially as delivered. I did something like this before, so it only took me a couple days worth of spare time to set this up so they could start using it. And it took only a few more hours after that to add additional features, like they wanted to have a fill down for several applications at once. If you have any questions on this workflow solution, uh, let me know. So far, this has been pretty easy, right? What could be easier? How about letting someone else do most of the work next time? That's cheating. I thought this presentation was about how a single FileMaker developer fulfilled $2.6 million worth of features. Technically, that's still true. I was the only official FileMaker developer to work on these features, but I had other projects I needed to work on. Then, I was lucky and found a user with lots of aptitude who was very bored doing her job the way everyone else did it. Since that magic evaluations calculator absolutely did not work, everyone else was still manually referencing over half a dozen resources on different web pages and using physical desk calculators to determine whether an applicant qualified for admission. 
Their whole process reminded me of an old eight-minute Marx Brothers routine called Tootsie Footsie Ice Cream, as seen in A Day at the Races, where Dr. Hackenbush gradually gets conned into buying a whole library of books just to get a tip on a racing horse. Anyway, my prospective victim figured out how to download some of the information she needed and do most of her evaluation calculations on Excel worksheets. <clears throat> and she had a dream that one day all the other evaluators could or would someday benefit by using the method she developed. Let's call her Jane C. She's not the same person as my programmer colleague that you've seen at the meetings uh, more recently, uh, who we hired later uh, by the name of Jane Wang. So, I gave Jane C. local copies of Next Steps she could look into and play with, and eventually I gave her full access to a copy on a test server. I decided that if she was going to develop a solution, it would be safer and easier not to put it inside of Next Steps. Uh, which was our biggest, most mission-critical system we have. Instead, I gave her her own file to work in, and we called it EvaluG, as in Evaluate Undergraduates. Over time, I spent a couple hours showing her my practices for creating tables, naming fields, using layout themes, and I answered all her questions on the way back from the water cooler. I gave her my FileMaker training series book and showed her some websites. And then she took the next few months gathering data resources, joining tables, and writing scripts. I check in every once in a while to make changes to the schema and layouts and the scripts. And she did a lot of her work on this solution on her own time. And this is the result. That big table occurrence group with the big red hub called UD Evaluations is what they use for upper division transfer evaluations. I told you it was complicated and used a lot of data sources. That little table occurrence group in the lower left with a little green anchor called FTF Calc is what they use for first time freshman evaluations. Simpler, but not simple. That $2.6 million magic evaluations calculator didn't consider even half of these data sources and relationships. I figured if $2.6 million and a dozen managers, project managers, and outside programmers couldn't figure this all out, why not let one subject matter expert give it a try on her own? <laughs> there might be a couple unnecessary relationships in there, but I had little need to mess with it. So they're still there. It works. And here's what the layout looks like for upper division transfer evaluations. That upper left portal is a list of colleges where the applicant attended. Uh, selecting rows in that portal controls which courses display in the portal to the right. Those courses are deemed transferable based on very large California college course equivalency tables behind the scenes. You can see courses crossed out and various field criteria in red. Everything's calculated and the results are summarized. And the, that stamp button down at the bottom, that little black one at the bottom, produces a summary that gets stamped onto the transcript image as an annotation. I didn't really think that was necessary in my opinion because all the data and everything was here, but it was part of their process. The first time freshman calculator is a lot simpler, but that one over on the right, uh, it, but does involve more manual input. They manually input all the A, B, C's, D's, F's over there on the far right, and honors, and they see uh, all that they see on the high school transcripts. The calculator tallies them, weighs them, assigns a GPA, assesses the GPA along with some external data, other external data, and determines if they qualify. All this goes into a stamp that goes onto the image of the high school transcript as an annotation. And both of these features are now used by all the undergraduate admissions evaluators. This project was an awesome thing to behold. To me, something more important happened than just getting a system to work or making people's jobs easier. 
This time, I helped someone achieve a dream and made a friend in the process. She not only became intimately knowledgeable about our most sophisticated FileMaker solution, but she learned about several other non-FileMaker systems at the same time and used all that knowledge to build a completely new solution. A senior articulation officer in the state, one of the sharpest and most demanding and critical people on campus, who had previously worked as an evaluator for decades, had this to say when she saw our work. This looks fabulous. Nice work. This will really help their process. This is the best application for the assist data for, for automating the evaluations of transfer work that I have ever seen. Double exclamation point. You should really let folks know about this at a higher level and outside of ES Enrollment Services. This is a fantastic tool for them. Meanwhile, Jane C., she was promoted from evaluator to business analyst and focused on improving all kinds of admissions-related systems and processes. So if you have any questions about uh, this last of four missions, go ahead and let me know. Well now, missions accomplished. $2.6 million worth of development in less than one year using only a fraction of my allotted work schedule. You might call that a stretch. I call it a tremendous boost to my ego. A contractor should call it hope to strike it rich someday. Someone might say, well, all you did was patch a $2.6 million system, but you still needed the $2.6 million system to begin with. No, I didn't. Remember the $100,000 system we had before the $2.6 million system? Not only could I have patched that system with all the same features in the very same way, but it actually would have been a lot easier, much easier and faster to work with that system than this one. Which means they did not need to spend $2.6 million for those features. Either way, what I was able to accomplish here, especially on that last mission, should get people asking. How do we build more $2.6 million developers? Well, Rome wasn't built in a day. And neither was Romulus. I think that's Romulus seated towards the front there. I might have achieved $2.6 million worth of development in less than a year, but it took me a few years before that to become that kind of developer. So what comes first? Well, no talk of Rome is complete without a quote in Latin. Neque enem quero intelligere ut credam, sed credo ut intelligam. And that means, I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but rather, I believe in order that I may understand. That sounds importantly counterintuitive to an empiricist, but... My observations bear it out. The things people believe always come first and continue either to promote or inhibit thought. If someone doesn't even believe a system can work or should work, they'll either never take the first step to understanding how it works and why it works, or they'll abandon the system as soon as they have any difficulty or as soon as they are offered any alternative. A child who believes anything is po anything is possible, might start out knowing very little, but is capable of learning anything. Meanwhile, people who are already convinced they understand everything are often the least capable of learning anything completely foreign to them. I first observed this maxim at work in myself. Whether it was a computer platform or a programming language, my enthusiasm and perseverance to work with technologies, even when they became repeatedly frustrating, ultimately derived from my belief that the technology was worthwhile to me in the first place. Apple, Apple Inc. used to advertise, think different, but that comes from fans who believe different. I was one of them because when I had a Mac on my desk, I believed that I could accomplish anything that could be accomplished with a computer. I also used to think that the same I used to think the same about knowing programming languages and opening and open source technologies. 
until I learned to qualify that belief. I might have been able to accomplish anything, but I can't possibly accomplish everything. Projects were taking months and years, and I couldn't keep up with all my ideas coding every single database and interface. So, just believe in yourself or just trust the technology are sure ways to lead to insanity. Unless the belief stays founded on a few reasonable internal realities and constant and growing relationship to possible external realities. Something I didn't tell you. The whole time I completed those four missions, I was working under an IT director who could not believe that the technology I was using should be used for mission critical operation or could best accomplish missions like that. In fact, he was actively employing three full-time programmers and other campus resources to replace FileMaker Pro with some other database platform. And whenever they wanted my help towards that end, I had to lend my understanding to, to those existing, uh, of existing systems also. Before him, I had three other IT directors who felt the same way and hoped to replace our FileMaker solutions with either DB2, Microsoft Access, SQL Server, or Oracle. I served most of my time as an in-house FileMaker developer under people who did not believe and could not understand how we were able to produce complete projects in hours, days, or weeks instead of days, weeks, or months. They'd keep acting surprised every week I came to a meeting to say a project was already done along with a few other things. That, uh, so every once in a while, we'd be between IT managers and we'd have an interim business manager. I received my largest raise and biggest promotion under business managers. So I get the impression, the impression that business managers are more interested with the business results I produced rather than the technology I used. Anyway, along the way, I believed enough in what I was doing and the technology I was using to take the following path towards becoming a $2.6 million developer. Two, get formal training from good experienced developers. I got my week-long FTS training from John Mark Osborne and Chris Ippolite. Uh, they were fantastic and inspiring to me, and, uh, and the training materials were nearly perfect. So I'm big fans of both of them and of Salient Consulting, who produced the FileMaker training series materials. That's not to say there aren't better trainers and materials, but I consider myself blessed to have got a kickstart from these at least. Start getting lots of development experience. <coughs> Build solutions for anything you can find. I'd get accused of treating everything like a nail just because I had a hammer. But everything I was looking at was data, so why not hammer it with a data application development platform? Get certified. The certification itself might seem more important for a contractor, but for an in-house developer, it's the preparation for the test that makes the difference. The whole point is to build developers who know the whole suite of features available to them and who know how to implement them so they can choose the best methods and execute them with minimal delay and error. Get inspired and stay inspired. That's why I go to DevCon whenever I can and why I start attended, attending DigFM. I believe in inspiration so strongly that I became a Dig FM co-chair and prepared this presentation specifically for the purpose of inspiring others, especially in-house developers. Get as much direct data access as you can to all the data sources you can get in your organization before you even need it. If the people in charge of security are doing their job well, they'll stop you from doing this. But if you can get the access anyway, that means you will always be prepared at a moment's notice to fetch any data that might eventually be required to build a solution for your organization. In fact, just having the access to the data has helped me think of all kinds of useful new solutions and features. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have built those if I hadn't seen the data uh, in the first place. Uh, seven. Build critical mass. There's a point when your solutions can say, 
contains so much useful information and so many process, processes that your solutions become the default solutions for your organization. It just becomes so much easier to simply add a feature to one of your solutions rather than to try to build a solution by some completely different means. Sometimes you, ha you have such a variety of large solutions that they begin to meet and support one another. That's what happened with all those that I have. Several of those are interrelated. Overdevelop in preparation for future projects. I often fetch more records and fields than I need, add supporting fields, tables, and scripts I don't immediately need or, or use. If I have any intuition that someone might eventually want or need it sometime in the future. This frequently becomes this frequently comes in handy because I've had several features ready or almost ready to use uh, when, when someone else needed them or wanted them. Right now, I'm in a fortunate place because my current IT manager does not have a technology agenda, but is rather agnostic, only preferring whichever technology most quickly fulfills a request or best fits the task or customer based on the most recent and most similar fulfillments. This led to something unprecedented on our campus. Last year, we hired our first employee ever to be explicitly assigned to work as a FileMaker developer. Every other FileMaker developer we've ever had on campus, including me, has or had some other job and just happened to fall into FileMaker development for some reason. The irony of this is that the day we interviewed her, she had only recently downloaded FileMaker, but instead of finding the FileMaker Pro trial, she found FileMaker Go, which kind of limited her experience even more. She did, however, bring a wealth of other skills and experience to the position, and in my opinion, a high level of humility and readiness to learn. Things have changed somewhat since we had uh, FTS training and materials, but I've talked to her about her favorite ways to learn. And she says she has found a wealth of video sources on the internet she likes to use whenever she needs to work on something specific. And when she wants to learn about a topic in depth. FileMaker.com and other sites have offered her most of what she needs to learn. In the community discussion on this topic, I'll share links to some of her favorite videos as examples. Finally, she gives credit to having other skill, another skilled developer close by who can answer all her questions. That would be me. Meanwhile, as a lead, I've been offering her assignments purposefully that utilize her unique skills and immerse her into the most the most breadth of our FileMaker solutions. For example, she is responsible for the nightly ODBC imports, which uses her SQL skills to improve our queries while introducing her to both the source tables in PeopleSoft and to at least half of the FileMaker tables in our solutions. Also in the past year, we've had some major changes to our PeopleSoft source tables, which have encouraged us to redesign and clean up some of our tables. And when you have to make changes to fields and tables in your solution, what kind of resources do you use? Uh, the database design reports you can get from FileMaker Pro Advanced. In addition to that, we've, reached, we've recently purchased Inspector Pro, which helps us get even more comprehensive and detailed information about all of our solutions all at once. That's especially helpful because most of our solutions have relationships to tables and now layouts that exist across multiple files. Both DDRs and Inspector Pro offer good technical overviews of existing solutions and the various FileMaker Pro features they utilize. Uh, speaking of Inspector Pro, next month on January 11th, we are getting a free one-hour training session from Vince Manano right here at Dig FM, right here at uh, in Santa Clara at, and FileMaker headquarters. Uh, before the ske regularly scheduled meeting at 6.30 that same day, that same night. Anyway, with all these resources and more at my new colleague's disposal, who knows? She might become our next $2.6 million developer much quicker than I did. And that's it for my presentation. 
You can discuss this presentation all you want, whenever you want in the community using that first URL you see there, or just search for digfm2.6 and you'll find the discussion for this presentation. Uh, also, if, you, if you'd like, you can follow our future post related to our user group at the DigFM group in the community. Uh, so let me know if you have any questions. Uh, that's it for now.